I appreciate being called a young man. And I don't have any soundtracks or anything because I've I'll pray for me. When you look at me, it's flesh and blood as far as you can see. And you may be quick to judge my life by this world's philosophy. But deep inside this vessel is a person known to man. As the spirit of the living God, and that's all I really am. Though this body's been condemned to die, there's something I must say. God's saving grace has made me now what I thought I'd be someday. I am not what I am, but what I'm going to be. God only sees the blood of Christ every time He looks at me. This inner man is perfect, even though you may not see. I am not what I am. I'm already what I'm going to be. When I look in the mirror now, the only face I see is a carnal silhouette created by humanity. Though I have been forgiven, sometimes the guilt remains, reminding me of all my past, and that makes me so ashamed. Oh, but in my heart I'm clean and pure, just if I'd never sinned. And eternity will soon reveal the righteous man within. I am not what I am, but what I'm going to be. God only sees the blood of Christ every time He looks at me. This inner man is perfect, even though you may not see. I am not what I am. I'm already what I'm going to be. Well, our in, internally we are as perfect as we'll ever be. Amen. And we are perfect through Jesus Christ, for we have imputed to our account the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who, who are in Christ Jesus. And I thank God that then when others look at us, they look at, at the exterior. And uh, sometimes we are judged uh, by that. And, of course, the Scripture does say you, you'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. But what they can't see is what the Lord, the, His perfected work in us, and I praise God for that. The Bible says of that, that uh, that seed of Christ remaineth in us, us, and he cannot sin. And so that part of us is perfect, I'm telling you, and will be till the day of redemption. And thank God for that. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We spent uh, 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 a few months in this uh, book uh, in our Sunday school class and dissected it a bit. And uh, in this book, and of course it had to do with a life under the sun without God. As being viewed by Solomon, he was looking at life, the Jehovah's Witness. I like to get a hold of this and try to uh, uh, twist uh, the theology involved here uh, because uh, they, they uh, put us on the uh, level of a, uh, an animal. And uh, where it talks about the soul, that uh, will this go, uh, body go back to the dirt and so forth. And uh, so they use that a whole lot, uh, but they don't understand that uh, they're looking at life under the sun without God involved. And, of course, uh, in the, the later part of it, Solomon kind of uh, came to himself a little bit and uh, refreshed himself and, and, and uh, 
showed us the true picture of what things were about. And uh, so we only look tonight at uh, something uh, from this passage in uh, chapter 7. If you were able to stand, stand and honor the reading of our Lord's Word and pass out a compliment or two to those by you. Would you kindly do that? Even though it's Wednesday, be complimentary. Pray for a little lady by the name of Audrey Hale. Uh, Audrey was un under our ministry uh, uh, previously, and she's been very sick. Matter of fact, she's dying now with leukemia. It came from her other diseases, and I love uh, uh, Audrey and uh, Jeremy, and uh, they're precious people of God. They've been here in the service with us uh, at times, and I love the family, the, uh, two wonderful children uh, with character, and uh, praise God, I got a chuckle every time I, I reminded Jeremy of this the other night that uh, uh, he went way up in Carolina and was preaching a revival at a church up there. And his, his first, uh, he hadn't preached over a time or two when he went up there to preach. And he got to preaching, and I noticed his face was awfully, awfully red and big veins popping out of his neck and everything. And he almost passed out because he forgot to breathe. He got so cared about, and, and he forgot to get his breath, and he just all but turned blue. And uh, uh, Audrey just has a, a, such a spirit to be a dying woman. A little lady, how old is Audrey? About 40, and, and uh, always just a, a wonderful uh, cooperative worker in church and loves the Lord, just a pure, great Christian. And uh, so you pray for that family right there. They're in deep sorrow, and uh, there by her bedside, uh, Washington. So you pay for, pray for Audrey Hale, Hale and um, the family there, if you will do that. Chapter 7 and verse 10. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Okay, read with me. Verse 10. Say not thou, what is the cause of the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Now, Heavenly Father, I yield myself to you as the servant of God. I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit without which I can do nothing. For you are the vine and I am the branch. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to me and may I speak to the hearts of these who are here today in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you and be seated. Now, uh, we hear so much about uh, uh, wonder why we don't have meetings like we used to. Uh, I wish things were back like they used to be. Well, I just want to announce to you that there's some things about used to be that I don't miss at all. And uh, I grew up in church in, uh, beginning in 1948 when my daddy got saved. And uh, uh, I don't miss uh, the church without an air conditioner. Uh, I don't miss uh, having to use a J Avery Bryan fan uh, to try to stay cool down just a little bit. And the more you fan, the hotter you got. Uh, because working out. Uh, I, I don't miss those slatted benches. I didn't know your behind could get so numb. But sit there on them slatted benches and those uh, preachers start preaching. And, oh, they didn't come to leave. They came to stay. And uh, they went to meeting in those days. And uh, uh, the, our, uh, the first church they had pastored, uh, the Foster, uh, you, you, you've heard of the Foster sisters, uh, who sang, well, the Forster family lived right by Head River Baptist and uh, uh, down close to where Miss uh, Gale grew up. And the Forsters would ride a wagon to church. They had some lanterns hanging on up the old emergency brake thing right there. And they'd ride that wagon there in 48 and, and, uh, or 50 and pull up to the church, you know, and uh, uh, pull out a, a, a weight out there with the, uh, uh, horses tied to that. And then after church, they'd go back, you know, one to hold the lantern and go back home uh, from that. I, I, uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't miss those slatted benches at all. I mean, uh, uh, just say thank God for these padded pews here. Yeah? Oh, yeah. And uh, then, of course, uh, uh, I, I don't miss those pot-bellied stoves. And uh, when we'd build a, a fire in that stove up there on that mountain, uh, there was something magical about that. Because when we built a fire in that pot belly stove, I mean, it would get red hot real quick, but then the heat would all go up, and the, it would wake the wasp up. 
and the wasp would begin to stir. And if you've uh, seen that Mississippi squirrel thing, well, you can imagine uh, some of the things that we encountered when the wasps began to uh, uh, swarm around up there and uh, from that uh, fire from that uh, pot-bellied stove. I remember that uh, my wife and I, we paid twenty-six fifty a, a month for rent uh, when we got married, and we lived in a, an apartment in the Mill Village down in Chickamauga across the tracks. Uh, we were those folks across the track, and we paid uh, twenty-seven fifty a month for our side of the apartment place uh, right there. Now, when KO service station had gas wars, uh, gas would come down. It would go from a uh, 35 cents a gallon to as low as 10 cents a gallon uh, that you could get gas for when they had a gas war. And if uh, one fellow had a, uh, lowered his gas, the other one did, next thing you know, it would bottom out. And uh, we'd buy the old thrifty oil in the two-gallon cans and things like that. And uh, I, I remember that. And then um, uh, I, I remember uh, so many things being so different, and most of them I don't miss at all. You know, I am thankful for uh, where God has brought us to. There's some of the things uh, uh, the Bible says that man in the last days would seek him out many inventions. And he has, and some of them has been to the ruination uh, of things. But I don't miss those things right there whatsoever. Now, uh, Solomon said that the good old days are a combination of a bad memory and a good imagination is what he is uh, trying to get across right here. And another said, today is tomorrow's good old days. Today is tomorrow's good old days. Now, there's some facts about the good old days. And, um, and then I'm going to talk to you about some things that the church had in the good old days that we need today. I probably won't get to much of it. Take a couple of time. I was going to start on uh, 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 the, the study of Jonah uh, the, uh, concerning the will of God for mankind. And, uh, but I, I, I just uh, was drawn to this. There's some facts about uh, good old days in America. From 1970 to 1992, a typical new home increased by an average of 600 square foot. At the beginning of the 1980s, only 45% of the homes, 1980, only 40, that, now to some of you all that seemed like a long time, but to me that was yesterday. But in the 1980s, only 40% of the homes had dishwashers. 40% of the home at dishwashers. And uh, uh, in August 2010, 75%, this was in 2010, ha ha had dishwashers. In 1970, the average home had uh, 1.4 televisions. In 1970, 1.4 televisions uh, to two and a, uh, and a third. In 2000, uh, uh, it increased more, and, and now we got them in every room. Uh, Dow Jones industry average had increased uh, sixfold since the early 1970s. Uh, we now have microwave ovens, answering machines, camcorders, home computers, home exercise equipment, cable TV, fax machines, soft contact lens. Uh, today's drivers go further on a gallon of gasoline than they ever did before in safer cars. And then a decade ago, a motorist had to stop and look for pay phones to make a call. Now Americans enjoy the safety and convenience of cell phones. Now, let me say, I don't know what we'd do without them, but I'd like to try. And uh, some of those other things I would like to uh, ditch, wouldn't you, and uh, do away with because they have become a royal... A ro uh, I'm not convinced, I, I, I'm almost convinced that the next war will be a cyber war with computers. It'll be acted out on computers, and right now the drones are run from down in Florida uh, with a, a big electrical station there, and they are flown there, and they shoot their missiles from Florida. Of course, the drones are over in the east, but they're running those things from uh, uh, ways bouncing off the satellite right there. Now, again, people are always talking about the good old days, and, and there's nothing at all wrong with remissing. Uh, we, we all uh, like to think back every now and then about uh, some of the times. Uh, I, I miss the simplicity of life of those days. Uh, I do. I, I, I miss the, uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, 
uh, you didn't have to have a permit to spit. Uh, now you have to have a permit for anything. If they catch you thinking without a, without a permit, you're in trouble. Uh, permit this and permit that. And, uh, and, and uh, the America of today, the young folks, they will never know the freedom that we enjoyed. We were, we were really free, weren't we? And now, now, you know, uh, we are under taskmasters that watch us. You burn a leave, and, and uh, I was burning uh, leaves uh, 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 Thanksgiving or two ago, and I looked out there, and there come a fire truck, emergency vehicle, uh, 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 ambulances, you know, and, and uh, I mean, they started bailing out, coming around each side of the house and ran out there uh, hyperventilating, you know, and I'm looking there like this, you know, and putting the, uh, one, the son-in-law putting the turkey in the deep fryer there, and I'm burning a little bitty pile of leaves. And they said, uh, 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 as, uh, when they got their breath, You're, uh, uh, you, you don't have a permit to burn those. Can you get, imagine that? And I said, uh, I, I'm just burning a little pile of leaves, fella. And he said, yeah, but you've got to have a permit to do that. You're, you're hurting the environment. Oh, have you seen that, uh, uh, that they're getting excited now because the, the, the polar ice caps are growing by several feet every, every month? That global warming getting us, isn't it? And you can't find Al Gore anywhere in the winter when that snow starts falling everywhere. But the, uh, but the fact is, uh, the, those good old days. Now, again, uh, how many times did the children of Israel cry and complain that they wanted to go back to Egypt? You know, we want to we want to return to the the leeks and the onions and the and the melons. They wanted to go back to the iron furnace and the brick kills there. Uh, you know, after God having cared for them that way. I mean, the, that's the good old days that they're talking about. Now, God, uh, uh, did He ever let them go back? Uh, no, no, God wouldn't let them go back. And God is not pleased sometimes when we live in the past. Now, uh, I, I know people, my wife and I meet people that we used to know back when we got saved in 68, Brother Bob. Uh, at that time, they had the same con spiritual convictions we had and everything else, uh, but something has changed. But they still only like to talk about those days. Now, they've changed their convictions, like, uh, you know, so not, as not to fit those days. But, but, but they, all they want to live is in the past. Listen, uh, I can't live in the past. Uh, I, I got to live in the here and now, the present. And Solomon tells us about that. And, and, and I'm thankful for uh, uh, home canned vegetables and pop bellied stoves sometimes. Uh, nothing as good as a, 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 a percolator of coffee with grounds poured in it on a, on a wood stove. And it starts boiling. I'm telling you, folks, that, uh, that, that, that's heavenly. Yeah. Can't y'all smell that right now? And, 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 then, and, and then that uh, uh, home hog raised bacon. Thrown in that pan and that grease sizzling, that smoke coming up. And I'm telling you the truth. Boy, that's the good old days, but I don't miss it, Okay. Now, I appreciate all that our grandparents endured for us uh, uh, as we came along and uh, uh, all, all that took place. Uh, but the fact is, folks, we just might well face it, uh, God has richly blessed us today. I don't want to go back. I don't want to live uh, under that. And you know what? I just want to say that uh, and talk to you about some things that the church had back in those good old days. Some of the church had uh, that I think we need today. Number one, the church had respect in the good old days. People respected the church of the living God. When we were playing and we were, we were a little bit demon-possessed, at that time we didn't know the Savior. Uh, we we uh, behaved because we were raised under strict discipline and, uh, and whatever. Uh, but we were taught some respect for things. I see people walk in this auditorium carrying uh, 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 drinks and, and wearing hats and things, and, and that offends me. You say, why does it offend you? Because it offends God. 
Uh, and two, it's an insult to your past parents saying, my parents didn't raise me right. And uh, uh, I mean, because uh, uh, I had a young man come in the other morning. Uh, he thought he had missed the bus. His daddy brought him in and uh, sat there at my desk. And he had a, a hat on, a hood on over the hat. And I said, uh, son, you're supposed to remove your cover when you come in the house, especially the house of God. And he said, oh, really? I said, really? So he said, okay. And I just looked at him a minute, and then he said, oh, okay. So he took it off and, uh, and pulled it off himself. But uh, uh, now the church had respect from people. We would be walking down the road laughing, cutting up, throwing rocks or something at one another. But when we approach the area of the house of God, and I want you to know the doors wasn't locked. You didn't have to lock the doors because people had respect for the house of God. You know, uh, but, but we would suddenly, I mean, it would get so quiet you could hear yourself breathe. And we wouldn't say another word, Brother Bob, till we got by the church, the house of God. Now, that was respect for what the church was, what it stood for, what it was. And uh, uh, what was there? What was there, folks, that gave? Uh, I, I, you know, I think of funerals. Uh, I remember when people used to uh, uh, dress up to go to church and, you know, the News Free Press wrote an article on this about the respect of how we used to dress to come to church. And we had special go-to-church clothes. That's what they were for. You know. uh, but now uh, uh, people go into a funeral home and there lays a saint of God that has died, that was pure all their life, and they disrespect them with unbelievable bad dress. Now, that's an insult, isn't it? Uh, but but what, what in the world uh, has happened to us? Why did people respect the church? Well, uh, it was respected because of its testimony. The church had a good testimony in those days. I mean, they were noted for being pure and clean and right. The church had a testimony of preaching. I mean, you go to church and you are going to hear preaching. Amen? Oh, listen, my friend, and I, I am sorry, but I am kind of hung up on that. And I say to the folks, we may have a cantata, but we'll still have some. It may be a small one, but we'll still have a little sermon. We're still going to have the Word of God, my friend. Preaching was the highlight of the service. It, it was not only uh, uh, the praise and worship part, uh, but it never replaced preaching. And people respected the church of the living God because of preaching. And it was when God's man took his place behind the sacred death and opened the Word of God and preached, Thus saith the Word of God. Now, again, their, their, their uh, methodology is a little different than us. They, I mean, they, they hacked and, and, uh, uh, and everything, and that's okay. Amen. If that's how they want to pray. And that is okay, but I like their purity. Amen. And the church had a testimony for preaching in 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And when the Word of God is preached, it is the Word of God that is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the Word. Be instead in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Amen. And he goes on to say, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but shall after their own uh, selves heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, oh, preacher, uh, 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 get dive down deep and come up dry. Uh, uh, teach us, teach us, teach us. Uh, you know what? If all you get from, from uh, uh, as spiritual food is what you receive right here, my friend, I have failed. I am supposed to whet your appetite to go home and put your face in the Word of God and pray and beg and study and look to the Word of God. So they had their uh, preaching, and then the church had praying. The church had praying. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about a little prayer yet. And then go to the kitchen yet. I'm talking about the church had real 
praying. Oh, you say, well, I don't, I don't, I, that bothers me, everybody praying at the same time. Don't bother God. He's omniscient. Amen. He hears every word. He hears everything. I, I, we grew up in prayer meetings and uh, at Mount Hermon Baptist Church. There's a woods down behind the church, an old log trail down there. Sunday evening, the pastor would say, let's go to pray. We would file out in a line. The men first. Back then, men led. And we would uh, follow the men, the boys would, down that old hog trail. On the way down there, we'd pick up a rock. Everybody picked up a rock because that rock represented something that they had on their heart, a burden. It represented a need. It represented a, a broken heart or a request from God or a sickness of a family member. And we'd go to that old rock altar and we'd place our rock uh, on that, I, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing uh, back then. I didn't know what it was about, but 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 we had fa uh, uh, fall down and put our rock there too. But I remember that the, uh, those pure people. I mean, uh, they might not uh, 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 have uh, uh, eloquent English. They might not. Uh, they might dangle their participles and and uh, they might uh, 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 misspeak. But I'm going to tell you, uh, they had a touch of God on them, and they prayed, and people got cured of cancer, and people got uh, saved from sin, and under conviction of the Holy Ghost, and the church was respected because there was a purity in the old-fashioned church because of preaching, because of, of praying. Ah, oh, 25 times prayer is mentioned in just the book of Acts. 25 times in that one book right there. Uh, prayer is the mark of a mighty church. Prayer is the, uh, the power of a mighty church. Oh, listen, now, now don't, you, don't you think, I mean, it, uh, it, it'll, it'll get big and then shrink up, but don't you think that when these men come out of Sunday school and go back here, to that corner room and they stop off there and, and, and pray for the preacher and the service. Don't you think you can't tell the difference when you come out here? There is a total different environment. Well, if it does that, why is it not important enough to some of us to do that? Why, why is it, friend, that that is so easily, easy to leave off uh, 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 and, and not be critiqued? Oh, I'm talking about uh, preaching and praying. And then the church had respect because it had a testimony of praising. Brother Eddie made a statement Sunday, and he said, uh, Why don't y'all smile if I was a lost person? I wouldn't want what you got. I got enough misery. A lot of people looking at, at, at folks that are so downcast. Now, we're going to all have burdens every now and then, are we not? But the fact is, we ought to come to the house of God and find something to praise God for. Amen? Oh, listen, my friend, uh, the church uh, was respected because of this thing of praise, and the church uh, had bended knees and spent time in prayer, and, and that church will experience blessing from God, and uh, it will lead them to praise and, and answer prayer. Now, listen again. Uh, I, I've noticed this about our choir. If we have a building full, they sound like the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. They do. I mean, something about it that initiates them to sing out with joy. It, it makes a difference, doesn't it? And praising uh, will make folks to respect you. And when people come, hey, uh, I, I don't like deadness, do you? I don't like dead church services. Uh, I like to hear praise the Lord and amen and oh me and part there a while. Amen. Oh, listen, my friend, I say this to you. Uh, uh, the fact is, uh, a church that is void of praise is a church that, that probably is void of prayer. And it's probably void of, of, of uh, converts too. Because people like to be around life I'm not talking about disorder. Boy, I have been in some that you would not believe. Uh, disorder. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about truly 
Hey, what's wrong with raising your hands and saying, praise the Lord? Are you ashamed to? I mean, it, does it embarrass you to give him a, the Bible says, uh, talks about a sacrifice of praise, which the Lord says is a sweet-smelling savor. When we come in here and we say, praise the Lord, and Brother Eddie forgets what page he's on. He starts singing one song and she's playing another because he got caught up in this thing. And you know what? Uh, we praise the Lord and, and uh, Jesus looks around at the Father and he says, Father, don't that smell good? Amen. Oh, listen, my friend, this church was respected because uh, it, it had of its testimony. It, it was a, a testimony of preaching and praying and praising. And then it was respected for its torch. The church was a torch. It was the light. I mean, you see, folks, when Highland Park had 70 chapels that dotted this landscape, and then along with almost 400 other Baptist churches in the surrounding area. You didn't have all that chilling up Chattanooga. You didn't have those red light districts and those meth labs in East Ridge. You didn't, hey, you didn't have all of that when this, this landscape was saturated with churches of the living God because they had a positive influence on communities. That's why those judges said, you cannot put those Ten Commandments up in the courthouse because they influence yours. Amen? Uh, you, go, uh, you go to a, a, a court to serve on jury duty and they find out that you're a Christian. They, some, uh, uh, they don't want you on some of them. And, and so uh, it was, had a torch. Uh, the torch is the Word of God. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. Psalm 19, verse 105. And now, again, it was respected, uh, uh, my friend, was respected. Uh, uh, God is the center of the church. The tool that we use to reach the communities for Christ, the tool we use to revive God's people, the tool to disciple Christians and help them to grow, the torch, the Word of God. And then it was respected for its trust. It used to be that the most trusted profession, or you might call it vocation, was a minister. But not any longer. Oh, you, uh, you, uh, you would not believe uh, the erosion upon our profession. Now, uh, uh, sometimes it's the pulpit, and sometimes it's the pew, but it's an erosion uh, upon uh, anything. I had some st statistics uh, to look at, um, uh, but maybe another time. It was respected for its torch. It was respected for its trust. It used to be the church doors were unlocked and people could go in day and night and uh, uh, some of our members asked for keys so they could come in uh, different hours and pray. I've, I've practically stumbled over them here. When I uh, come in in the dark, they're there praying and, uh, and, and, and calling on God. And the fact is we, uh, we need that trust. Now, uh, why don't people get under conviction today more than they used to in those days? I can remember it. I can remember people getting in their car and start to leave the church and, and, and pull out and turn around and come back. And, and I've seen them come in. And this would bother some of you, but run down the aisle and dive and slide under the altar and begin to pray with, with contrite and broken heart and a contrite and broken spirit with tears scalding their cheeks and saying, oh, God, I don't want to die and go to hell. I remember uh, uh, we didn't have fans and except J. Avery Bryan funeral home fans, and it was hot. The windows were open, and some of those guys would sit in the window and, and listen to preaching. And uh, I remember old Henry Drew before he got saved and had a, a, a 48 Ford and uh, a flathead. He was known for his uh, cars. And I remember he, Henry tried to leave the church 
and he couldn't because he got arrested by the Holy Ghost. And I've seen such old-time conviction. I've told you the story, but let me tell you again, probably in closing, about uh, uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Rodney and uh, 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 Char uh, Charles Roddy. Charles Roddy. And uh, Charles had a, a, a red-headed, real red-headed wife, that, and she was a member of the church, and she'd say, pray for Charles. And so the church began to pray. The church where I was called to preach at began to pray for Charles Roddy. And... Um, uh, matter of fact, Charles came to one of our services here the other night uh, of, uh, a few weeks, maybe a few months back, and sat right back over there. Uh, Charles sat there. And uh, uh, the pastorium at that time was close to the church, but uh, the custodian was using the pastorium, and the pastor lived over uh, there where Dad uh, lives now. And Charles Roddy pulled up, uh, put on his brakes, and slid up on the gravel right there, and got out, knocked on the door, and he said to the fellow there, he said, where's the pastor? And, and, and the fellow said, well, the pastor's at his house. He said, I, and he was shaking. He said, I've got to see the pastor. And he said, well, he said, uh, 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 you want me to give him a call? He said, I, I've got to get saved. He said, I, 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 I can't take it any longer. I have got to get saved. Well, the fellow said, I tell you what to do. Get in your car, and here's where you go. And he told him how to get over there. Not, I mean, just a, a two turns to the, to the whole place, you know. And he began to tremble and cry. And he said, I can't do that. And the, and the fellow said, why, why can't you go over there? Why can't you drive over there? It's just, you know, three minutes from here. And he said, if I were to have a wreck and get killed, I'd go to hell. And he said, I don't want to go to hell. And he wept and trembled, and that fellow took him over there, and he was passed from death to life. He was born again. Old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction. You can have that coming down the aisle, smacking, chewing gum, and smiling all you want to. And get up and, and go out as lost as you come down. No change in your life. You know, my friend... Uh, uh, that, that's not what gets the job. That did not come from the churches of old. We knew what conviction was. Conviction, you know. I was preaching uh, one night. I said to a man, I said, uh, uh, I said, uh, you know, uh, you worry me. He said, how's that? I said, I preach my heart out to you. And I said, you sit back there with your wife. And I said, you're not a bit moved by the Word of God. And I know God's touches on me. And that worries me to see you stand back there cold and unmoved. Tears came to his eyes. He said, oh, preacher. Preacher, you just do not know. He said, I hold to that bench until my knuckles. I looked one day and my knuckles were perfect. I held that bent so so tight. I I was so touched by God, and I said that worries me even more. That worries me even more. I said, what if I were to, uh, uh, you were to come to my house, and uh, uh, you were to knock at the door, and and I opened the door, and saw it was you, and I slammed it, and I said, oh, you know, and went just went back and sat down watching television. I said, uh, uh, how many times would you come back? He said, I'd never be back. I said, well, that's just exactly how the Holy Ghost feels. When he convicts you, he stands at your heart door and knocks. And you slam the door in his face and walk away. And that's the same to the saved people, too, that God convicts about sin. I'm just saying to you folks, there's some things about the old-time church. No, I'm not talking about the slatted benches. No, I'm not talking about the, the fans that they had. No, I'm talking about the purity and the power. I, I'm talking about the fact of the, the love between God's people and the prayers that, that took place that moved heaven. I believe prayer ought to move heaven. Amen.
and tonight. I miss that part of the church. I miss that, don't you? As Brother Eddie has come with the song. Maybe there's something about your life that you have uh, left off. You remember how it was then? Uh, you remember how sincere you were in prayer and the Word of God and going to church? Oh, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm still not over that. I can't stay away. I cannot stay away from a church church, can you? And, and that just came with my salvation. And oh, my friend, I say today, we need to uh, get closer to God. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. That's what the Word of God says. So tonight, He kind of put the ball in your court. What about you? Would you like to take that step up? If you're here today, lost, I don't know everybody's heart, can't see your heart, and need to be saved, come tonight. Maybe you need that stirring, that revival in your heart. As our brother is singing, say yes to him tonight. 